Hey guys, I'm here with a review for Moonraker. Uh, so, this one is, in my opinion, the most outlandish and crazy plot, uh, well, more specifically, villain plan in the series, for sure, of them all. Uh, doesn't even come close. But um, my issues with the film don't stem from that. I'm fine with that. Some of my favorite movies are movies that are unapologetically dumb and just go overboard. Um, but yeah. So, Moonraker, well, we're basically following, it's very simple, um, I guess you could say there's going to be some spoilers in here because, uh, there's sort of like a fake plot and then a real plot. So the fake plot is that this rich billionaire guy, Hugo Drax, um, is funding the governments and, uh, he, one of his space shuttles is captured and then Bond is employed to try and find out what happens. But it turns out that he basically staged it himself. Um, I, there was a throwaway line why he did that, um, but I don't really remember 100%. But um, then he gets the help of Dr. Goodhead, another amazing Bond girl uh, name, um, who's actually working for the CIA. And uh, eventually Bond and Goodhead have to go into space together. And they do this big Star Wars battle. And Jaws returns and he has a little bit of a subplot uh, where he finds a love interest. And he actually also gets his first ever speaking line, and damn, he has a voice on him. I, like, is that his real voice? Because I wish he would have spoke. Like, part of the novelty and why Jaws is, like, so beloved is because he's mute. He's literally, like, a mute, you know, giant. Um, but now that I've heard, now that I heard him, I want to, like, see if he's done any other movies and, like, go watch him in that. Because he's a very nice voice. So, yeah, it gets crazy. And so the villain's plan is, um, I don't even want to try and understand it, I uh, just, I don't really care to dive that deep, uh, but really, he's trying to, so he sets up a Noah's Ark, um, but instead of animals, he pairs off a bunch of beautiful looking, um, people, Honest, honestly, I, like, what was weird to me is that they, they make it a point to show how diverse the women are on his base, but then once they're up in space, they're all white. So I'm wondering if there is like a little bit of a white supremacy angle to it. I don't know. Um, that actually would have helped explain things a bit better. But uh, as it stands, he basically just takes a bunch of pretty looking men and women into space with him. And he's going to send down a bunch of canisters with nerve gas to commit genocide against everyone on Earth. And then he's going to um, have his perfect specimen humans uh, repopulate, and then he's going to send their children down to the earth to uh, restart the world. Why is he doing that? I don't know. Um, if I had to guess, it's some sort of Nazi, fascist, white supremacy thing, but they don't ever tell you that, so it's kind of left up to your imagination. I don't really know why he's doing that. Bad guys just got to do bad guy things. I guess we can sum it up like that. But um, yeah, okay, so let's hop in with the the negatives and it's not that long of a list again like i said i don't have a problem with the plot being stupid and over the top ridiculous and all that the movie's very obviously going with it right like it only annoys me when it's like movies are taking themselves seriously and there's a bunch of dumb stuff in there but like if you're if the movie's tone is very silly which this one is this is one of the most lighthearted bond films there is maybe that's why they didn't throw the nazi fascist stuff in there um, which, yes, would have helped explain things better, but also would have dampened the mood greatly. So this is one of the more um, eccentric and outlandish and just kind of crazy blockbuster hits, and I know that they moved this release date up. This is the only Bond film that had its release date um, moved forward and switched places with another one, because chronologically Ian Fleming's books, it, it doesn't happen in this order. The reason for that is because of uh, two years before this movie came out, was George Lucas's Star Wars, of course. So they wanted to capitalize on that hype. Um, but yeah, okay, so the negatives, other than the obvious ones. Like I said, we're not going to talk about the tone or how ridiculous or how it makes no sense and all that. Um, I can accept all that. So the things that are still issues after accepting that for me, and this is nitpicking, absolutely. So I would say Drax is one of the more forgettable and um, over just underwhelming villains of the series. I've never particularly liked him. I know he's kind of a favorite of the fans, I think, but I've never really, um, I've never really been sold on him that much. Uh, so he's not, he's one of the weaker villains in my opinion. Dr. Goodhead, you know, on the plus side, at least she has self-respect, but on the downside, 
she pales in comparison to most Bond girls in the franchise because, like, we just came off of The Spy Who Loved Me, which just gave us a Bond girl that had a fully fleshed out background and actually had a respectable name. Other than her name, her code name was Triple X, Agent Triple X, but I don't know. I was able to look past that because she was actually like a real character. Dr. Goodhead is not a real character in this. She is just a pretty face. Just the more stereotypical Bond girl. So yeah, the Bond girl and the villain are both some of the weaker ones in this series. So I think that this movie feels longer than it is. And I think the reason for that is because it takes an extraordinarily long time to actually start moonraking. Like for them to actually enter space. like. This, this movie is better than You Only Live Twice, but when it comes to space comparisons, You Only Live Twice does have the advantage of, like, it shows you space scenes throughout the film. This one, you, you don't get space scenes throughout the film. You get one at the beginning and then one at the end. So after you're done with the beginning, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of, you know, mediocre to slightly below average Bond content and action scenes in general compared to the rest of the series. But then, you know, the space scenes at the end absolutely is the reason to watch this, and it, it's very unique, and there's nothing else in Bond like it. Um, you get, like, a full-on Star Wars, la like, blaster rifle, laser fight. Um, it's like, there's nothing else like it, so that's the reason to watch it. And um, it takes a long time to get there, but in its defense, it is worth it. It is very much well worth it. The soundtrack is really good. I mean, every single soundtrack... Um, I was going to say every opening song. No, every opening song except like two or three are good in this franchise. And every single soundtrack in every single Bond is really good. But I just want to specifically mention that this one has a particularly awesome one. Um, especially when they get into space, it feels so cinematic. And it helps the stakes. I mean, the stakes are already high, but it really helps elevate the material further when you've got that epic orchestral music playing. So, yeah. Um... Unique things I like about it? Well, the reason to watch this is for Bond in space. If you've ever wondered what would happen if James Bond goes to space, the question is answered in this one. So that is the reason to watch this. That's the reason to buy, you know, back then if you were to buy a ticket for this, that's the reason and it does deliver on that aspect for sure. Um, I always like the little bit of like culture stuff that they throw in these kind of Bond films and it's just like this in here too. I especially liked when they were you know, it's it's a really clever thing when you create a scene where you have, you know, your main characters just like strolling through a scene, um, sort of in the background, and then in the foreground you've got like, you know, a tour group, and then it's just, it's basically, it's a really nice way to like educate the audience on some stuff, because like I don't know a lot about history and artifacts and all these various locations and stuff, and since Bond does travel around the world in his adventures, I always appreciate that we get lots of uh, history and little tidbits and fun facts. So, yeah. And um, I know I did say the action is occasionally below average, but that's actually not entirely true. I would say this choreography is better than some of the past choreography. Uh, the punches do have more weight to them and they do feel a little bit more real. But um, I do want to say, and this is a double-edged sword, this one. So I like the double entendres and I like how lighthearted this film is. But man, it can go overboard in comedy sometimes. Like, uh, for example, when Bond is taking his boat through, he's literally like, his boat is on wheels throughout the streets and we get these various scenes of like, um, you know, the guy's like gonna give up alcohol because he sees, sees Bond driving around in the streets on his boat. And then there's this guy who's gonna give up smoking because he sees a coffin in the water. Little scenes like that, they just make me roll my eyes and groan so hard. And when the pigeon double takes, oh Lord. When the pigeon double takes, I would not say that's the worst scene in the entire series. In my opinion, the vote for the worst scene in all of Bond is, um, it already happened. Um, it was when they uh, messed up the corkscrew stunt with a sliding whistle sound effect. But the pigeon might be second worst uh, scene in the Bond series. Because like, I, I think Octopussy has Roger Moore dressed up as a clown, which is also like in top 10 worst scenes. But I think I hate the pigeon double take more. It's just so dumb. They actually have like a pigeon do a double take because the pigeon's like so flabbergasted at fun that it just, it's just so dumb. But yeah, like I said, this movie's unapologetically dumb and fun. It has a great soundtrack. And um, even if Dr. Goodhead isn't a great Bond girl, all things considered, 
I do think these actors pass the chemistry test with each other. Um, you know, there's not always perfect chemistry between all of the leads in your favorite movies. This is an example where, you know, in terms of character, Bond girl, she's like the bottom of the barrel. But in terms of like chemistry with Roger Moore, pretty high, very high in fact. Um, so yeah, Moonraker, very mixed bag. I know I kind of criticized it a lot, but I do want to stress that this actually is one of my favorite Bond films just because it's so much fun. Like it's, you ne there's never a dull moment in this. It's always, something's always happening. You're always smiling. You're always having a good time. And this is definitely one of the ones I look forward to the most just for Jaws, really. I mean, he straight up gets a full on, um, well, not full on, but he like, he, the fact that he gets a love interest subplot is so, it just encapsulates why this movie's so different. And another thing I want to say in this defense is, um, this might have the single scariest scene in all of Bond as well. I know I just said it's like probably the most lighthearted of all of them. Um, but before things get really fun and goofy and lighthearted, towards the start of the film where it's still a little bit more grounded, we get this really terrifying scene um, where Dobermans are unleashed on this woman running in a forest. It's edited really well and it's pretty scary to be honest. I don't think I've ever had like... I don't think I've ever been scared in Bond, but that scene never fails to like shock me. So yeah, Moonraker is going to get a generous 6 out of 10. Yes, it's dumb. Yes, it would never happen in real life. Um, also, why is he pairing off, like if you're going to take 100 women and 100 men, why don't you just take 50 men and 100 women? Why do you need, like it's not Noah's Ark. You, I don't know. That was just, like for such a, for such a smart billionaire, I just didn't get a lot of his decision making in this, but um, yeah, 6 out of 10 for Moonraker. You have to see this if you like sci-fi, and you definitely have to see this if you like James Bond, uh, because you're never going to get something like this ever again. It's a one-off, and it's a very memorable one, so thanks so much for watching, and I will see you next time.